Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Social Chatter. This is episode 122. My name is Christian Karasevich, CEO and founder of SocialChefs.com, and we are bringing you the latest social media news from this past week. Uh, I'm joined tonight by my co-host, Nick Rishwain. Nick, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I am fully recovered and uh, back uh, to about 100% now. So uh, all is well. I'm just excited to uh, get to there's some big stories this week. So I'm excited to get our guest in here who many of our many in our audience will know. Uh, I want to thank Joanne for being here. She's here right at 7pm. Uh, and uh, Joanne Crawl, our guest from last week's already here. And we've got Fernando Ramirez waiting for us. And so uh, I'm, I'm ready to get rolling. How about you? I definitely am, too. I mean, I, I'm excited about tonight's topics. I think there's a lot of really useful ones that a business can really apply um, or start to think about because it's going to make you want to change your strategy, I think. So, yeah, there's certain things, certainly things that they need uh, that businesses need to be aware of and uh, start to change strategies for social media. Absolutely. So I'm going to bring on our guest. I'm going to let you do the introductions. Our guest tonight, Cameron Murray. Um, he goes by what? Kemi Sutra 6, I think, on Twitter. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. On, on Twitter and, and pretty much across the board. So our, our guest tonight is Cameron Murray. He's in Glasgow, Scotland, and he is a... Uh, He's a content creator above all else. Uh, Cammy and I participate in a, as well as Joanne Crawl in a fun little fake news venture that, uh, he is the founder of. He's the managing editor and anchorman of the CNT news channel, uh, which is Cammy News Television. And, uh, he's a Snapchat ambassador for Glasgow in his day job. I'm going to let him tell us a little bit about his day job, which I've never really discussed with him, but he is in marketing. Uh, in, in, in advertising, I believe, Cami, but I don't know for certain. Cami, welcome. <laughs> Glad you're here. I, I know it's very, very early where you're at right now. So uh, how Nick, is everything? Honestly, Christian, Nick, honestly, thank you so much, first of all, for having me on. Um, and Nick, my goodness, I think it's the nicest things you've I've ever heard you say about me. So... <laughs> I'm and it'll be the last that. time. It'll be the last time. I fully expect that. That's why this is on record. But um, but hi hi everyone. My name is my name is Cameron. I'm from uh, from Glasgow, and my secret job is um is I I actually work for a branding agency. Um, we're based out of Glasgow. We've got a we've got a, we've got an office in Amsterdam, which I I try to frequent as often as possible. But um but yeah, I mean I I deal with. Social media. I'm the social specialist for us. We uh, we focus mainly on. We're doing a lot of work with universities at the moment. We're doing a lot of work with whiskey brands. I mean, what would you expect from a Glaswegian other than alcohol-based branding? To be honest. <laughs> so, it, it, and you and you are really creative, Cami. Uh, and I will I will say that. And we've got a lot of people here in the uh, in the in the audience with us tonight. We've got Mo Lilienthal, Amanda Robinson, Kim Flex here, Joe Wilson, uh, Joanne Crawl, and I th about half or more of the people who are in the audience with us right now know of uh, Cami Sutra 6 on Snapchat and uh, the CNT News Channel. Uh, some of them are, are also participants there. You, you have got some excellent editing skills. Where did you pick these things up? Did you do this? Is this all learned from your branding experience or is this uh something you did just uh on your own you know i am very much i'm very much self-taught i uh i actually stayed away from social media most most of my, most of my life I only really picked it up and um, when snapchat arrived on the horizon and then um, to be honest it was when i picked up snapchat i realized it was a it was an out, an outlet so that you could be creative. It wasn't just a normal hyper <laughs> hyper nonsense that you see on other social platforms. It gave you the opportunity to be creative, to to actually make a connection with people. And then um, being Glaswegian, I understand that uh, not everybody can understand every word that I say. So when it came to Snapchat, I got to I got to show them exactly what I meant. And, uh, and it kind of spawned from that. Is 
one thing led on to another. And before I know it, I'm sitting talking to Snapchat, trying to teach people about how you can bring cinematography effects or approaches or techniques to Snap. Two years ago, I would never have said that. And, and it just goes to show if you actually do something every day, you do get better at it. You do get better at it. And that's, uh, that's how I've uh, learned uh, with, the, with the help of Christian and others. I, I've sort of learned uh, social media just by having to do it every day. So with that, Christian, any, uh, any announcements before we kick off into the news stories? Oh, he's coming back in. I'm sorry. Christian, uh, Christian got booted or booted himself. Hi, Kim. Welcome. <laughs> are, are you back in, Christian? I am. Yes, actually. Yeah. So I actually booted myself out of the live show somehow. Okay. Um, well, you're back I was, now. Oh, I was like, where am I? So, yes. So um, let's see. I want to say welcome, Cameron. Um, I, I do want to say the one thing that you just mentioned a minute ago, which I think is really just a really great example. Um, you talked about how on Snapchat, it gives you the opportunity, the freedom to be creative. And I think a lot of businesses and a lot of people forget about that. Like they they join the social network and then, you know, maybe they're not creative people and they join it because they think like, Hey, this is really easy for my business. And, you know, that's where you're going to really get the value out of things. I mean, you're going to, you know, if you're creative um, or you spend the time saying, Hey, you know what, what can I do to make my brand stand out? It's not about just doing the work. It's about doing stuff that's going to be unique. That's going to be different than what everyone else is doing because then like, you know, Hey, why should somebody watch, what you're doing when someone else is doing the exact same thing. So it's about being creative and you're right. Snapchat gives you the tools. I think that's why people think it's confusing or, um, you know, they think it's confusing because they don't have the, you know, they haven't had to think creatively necessarily. They just kind of, you know, go through the motions. So the motions. I think that's a fantastic example. And I think Cammy and I agree that Snapchat is one of the more fun platforms for that and more creative platforms. And, and, uh, and as Joe Wilson, who's in, in the audience, uh, as he's mentioned before, if if you're not having fun doing the social media stuff for your business, then don't do it. Get somebody else to do it. If you're not enjoying it, uh, then 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 stop doing it. Uh, it's you know unless you have if you have to do it because you can't hire somebody else, then then try and have some fun with it. Try and enjoy yourself a little bit. Try and as as too many people have said in the past, be social. Uh, Christian, shall we, any announcements before I jump into the, uh, the stories or should we jump right in? Uh, I just want to encourage everyone who's watching. Well, first off, I want to thank everyone who's watching. And, uh, by the way, Cameron, I apparently like, I didn't realize it was that early for you. It's really early for me as well. So, but I think you got me beat. Um, but I want to say <laughs> thank you to everybody for tuning in. And I want to say, um, you know, if you can, just do us a favor, hit the share button and invite your friends to come join us. You know, we've got a quick 40 minute show, 40, 45 minute show here. Yep. So let's get let's get going. Let's do it. Uh, did you want I'm going to go ahead and start with the Facebook. We're going to leave the Facebook updates till the end, the, the major <laughs> updates. So yeah. I'm going to start with Facebook testing a new section of the app. Sure. Uh, yep. specifically for local news and events. Uh, and uh, Cammy, one of Cammy's favorite topics here, local news, is uh, so Facebook is testing. They, they want to make it, this is, comes from Recode, and this came out uh, this week. Uh, it, Facebook wants to make it easier for people to find local news from vetted sources. That being the key of uh, is what I get from this entire article. Social Network is testing a new section inside its app called Today In, a, a feed made up entirely of local news events and announcements. They're starting it, and I don't know that we have anybody in the audience from, from any of these six cities, but they're starting it in New Orleans, Little Rock, Billings, Montana, Billings, Montana, Peoria, Illinois, uh, Olympia, Washington, and Binghamton, New York. So that's where they're testing these, this uh, today in local news feed. Uh, Facebook users who self-identify as living in those areas will be able to visit the news section to see local information, like stories from local publishers or emergency updates from local authorities. Using machine learning software to surface content in this new section, local news publishers who appear there will be approved and vetted by the company's news partnerships team. 
Uh, again, vetted, used a second time in this uh, article already, and it's a short article, which is overseen by former NBC News anchor Campbell Brown, according to a company spokesperson. The company says it's all part of Facebook's journalism project initiative, which I think we covered last January, if I'm not mistaken, Christian. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, mm -hmm which Facebook launched shortly after last year's U.S. presidential election uh, in which so-called fake news spread on the service, leading many to point to Facebook as part of the reason for Donald Trump's surprising victory. So they're really working on this. Cami, being the editor and anchorman of a fake news station yourself, what are your thoughts on this? Do you know, as um Look, it's something Facebook had to do, right? They have to, they have to be seen to be reacting to the, the chaos that helped create in the past year. I'm very, uh, I'm very dubious, like you'd mentioned, of the word vetted. That is a, a very short article that I read, the same one as yourself, I'd imagine, and it's popping up twice. And, and I know this is something we're possibly going to speak about later on, but, uh, you see the same with YouTube just now. They are they're bringing on so much more staff who are going to be focused on vetting the content now. Maybe maybe this is the rebel in me, but um, as much as I think it is important that we that we do get rid of hate speech. I mean, hate speech is terrible, but I think there's a difference between hate speech and unpopular speech, and this whole vetted angle makes me feel that. Who, who's deciding if, if this is hate speech or is it unfavourable? Because I know from covering fake news that, that we sometimes cover topics that are maybe a little bit controversial. Right. We, we very much push the envelope as much as we can. But who's to say that, that I'd say making a, making a, a report about it, extreme wrestling, shall we say? Mm -hmm. Who's to say that would get past the, the vetting process? So you're 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 concerned about censorship. Is it is it going to be censored, or or are they really trying to just help uh, real uh, and and uh, established uh, news agencies to uh, to provide uh, proper information? Is that what you're kind of thinking of? Yes, one hundred percent. I mean, it it almost feels like it's it's one step. This is the first step they're taking towards creating a. I'll compare it to a local discover section, the mm -hmm. discover section you'll find in Snapchat. Um, it almost feels like brands were really sorry that we're going to reduce your organic reach, but we're going to create some local news and some events and you're going to be really big on that and it's going to be really popular, we promise. <laughs> right. I'm not 100% not convinced of it. But, um, uh I'm not convinced either that it's going to be necessarily that uh, that successful. It'll be interesting to see what metrics they provide us with. Christian, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think overall, from a business standpoint, I think this is a very useful feature. If so, like I, I'm taking two angles here. I think one, if I'm you know the if I'm the site that gets featured on here, my content gets vetted. I do agree with you all. Like you know what's you know. I'm glad that their staff, for instance, they like they're adding staff to be able to vet this content. Um, I think that that needs to happen, but I also think that they need to trust their users a little bit more. They need to trust their users. Maybe, you know, instead of hiring staff, why don't you actually bring on brand ambassadors or ambassadors for say Facebook to help, you know, uh, review some of this content. I think that will help people trust the site a lot more. Now on the flip side, if I'm a business, I think this is actually going to be a very useful thing for you to have. Because a lot of times businesses, what they don't have the time to go like check their local news or to check all these other different websites. Most of the time, they don't even know what the website address is. So in this case, I like the fact that I, as a business, could conceivably go to this section and see local news and events, and then maybe try to capitalize on that and capitalize on it in a positive way. So for example, if I go to a local news event and I find that there's, you know, like say there's a really bad snowstorm or a really bad accident. I could potentially provide services to the people that are affected by this and help them out and obviously get my business name out there, but do it in a way that, you know, is a smart way um, or learn about an event that I could go advertise at, or maybe I need to make a presence there, you know, get a booth or something. So I think that, you know, from that perspective, a uh, very good uh, feature, but I think that, you know, they do need to trust um, vetting all this content because, you know, it, 
it's a lot of content to vet. <laughs> it's a lot to vet, and it, and it can, and I think Cammy's uh, Cammy's point is well taken. When does it become censorship over uh, over uh, just vetted uh, for for accuracy? Anyway, we don't want to get stuck on that for too long because we got a few other stories here, including including a couple more from Facebook. Uh, this one, this one is interesting, Christian. You you posted this uh, link. Facebook Live has changed how people come together around video. Uh, and this is just a post on, on Facebook. Uh, and I'm not sure uh, who it was. Uh, Fiji Simo is, is who posted this. I mean, it sounds like she's part of Facebook, uh, Facebook Watch. Um, today, live videos generate an average of six times uh, as many interactions as regular videos. This year, we are thinking about how to bring what makes Facebook Live so special the interactivity and community to more video experience to, to more video experiences on Facebook. So she's really excited in a watch party. Members of a group can watch videos together in the same space at the same time. Videos are chosen by the group admins and moderators and can be any public videos on Facebook live or recorded. With everyone watching, commenting, uh, commenting and reacting to the same moments together, it creates a shared viewing experience for video that helps build the kind of community and engagement they've seen with live. And, and we're grateful for everybody who's here tonight. Uh, so it seems to be that they're turning what, what we're doing here with. We've got Mo and Joanne and Nicole and Joe and all our well, uh, a lot of our friends. Uh, Monique is also here, you know, so now they're trying to move this into sort of a group activity where you can participate and watch videos together. I, I'm, I'd be, I'm really interested to see how this works. Cami, what are your thoughts on this? As a, as a concept, I, I think it's, yes, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I don't know what they're going to call it. Uh, Facebook echo chamber, maybe just depending on the, the video you're watching. But, um, Again, again, it's the cynic in me, but um, the fact that you can only watch Facebook videos mm -hmm. or recordings is, is the issue that kind of lies with me because I just know through experience of, of working with video and working in video that it's YouTube. YouTube you, is where I go for video and mm -hmm. I can see us all having, uh, hypothetically, we're having a, a Facebook watch group just now and we're watching a video that the conversation leads to, oh, I know what video I want to show you guys, but it's over on YouTube. Yeah. So can we just break up this group and we'll go and we'll watch the video and we'll come back. And you know what I mean? I, I, I think there's a, I think there's a disconnect there. It, it's a fantastic concept, but in it practice, yeah, practically, uh, pr in, in, in the practical use of it does seem like it'll be limited until the quality of Facebook Live or recorded videos improves. Except, at least that's my experience. Christian, what are your thoughts? So I think, yeah, I mean, this is a very, it's a weird feature because if you read about it, like they're just doing it right now for um, for groups. But I'm trying to figure out, like, well, how's this any different than like just sharing a video saying, hey, guys, you know, go watch this because... Um, I don't, you know, I think that that's one of the beauty of live video or, you know, in this case, you can do live video or pre-recorded video, but that's one of the beauties of live video is being able to actually get people to tune in to watch it kind of like TV broadcasting. So I know from Facebook's perspective, they're probably doing this as a way to come up with new opportunities, new places to do some advertising and to steal some of those TV dollars. Um, last week, I think it was, we talked about the fact that they were getting the pre-show for the Golden Globes. And so this is a good, you know, this is a good precursor to say, hey, you know what, chances are they're going to come out with a watch party. And if somebody's doing, you know, Facebook watch for something like that, I think it's very, you know, useful. But the concept of like me actually tuning in and watching a video with my friends, I mean, I'm doing that right now. I don't need Facebook watch parties necessarily to do that. Um, that's right. So that's the part where I'm like, okay, well, what exactly makes this unique? Because, hey, I can comment and I can engage and I can react just like I'm doing now. Um, yeah. So and, if, and I think yeah. that to, to County's point, why wouldn't I post that YouTube video in the group and watch it and then let people watch it in their own time and comment as we go? If, if it's something like that, uh, you know, it, Hey, watch this when you get a chance. I get, they want us to do this 
almost like a movie going experience uh, right. together, but with only uh, only having access to Facebook uh, content, I think it, it does limit the experience. Yeah. So everybody that's watching, like, what do y'all think about this feature? Does it make sense to you? Do, you know, do you have any ideas on like what kind of Facebook might be doing here? I, I mean, I think Nick, you know, I think it's tied into movies and TV. I think it's going to actually go beyond, even though it's groups right now. I think it's right. going to go beyond the idea. I think it's going to push people to use Facebook Watch as a means to develop a show page um, to then have essentially a viewing party for your favorite. And, and I should just get a whiteboard and do a diagram here. Um, but I think they're going to move you to do Facebook Watch for a regular show, essentially like we do this show every week, and then have it where people can say, hey, let's tune into this show and watch together and chat about it, even though we're you know dispersed all over the world. That's right. That's right. And and if if Facebook's listening, which we know they are, uh, we will accept a, a Facebook sponsorship. Uh, and <laughs> and I, I also accept Bitcoin uh, and other forms of uh, uh, currency payments. So just just we should put that out there, Christian, at the very least. Yeah. Uh, our next story. Cammy, did you have a, a last thought on that before we moved on to the next story? Yeah, sorry, just just very quickly. It, it's um, it almost feels to me that what Facebook have done, as we all know, Facebook just seem to offer everything. Now, they just do everything, and I think it's almost Facebook's reaction to if you if you take a look over at Twitch, for example, you'll see a lot of kind of younger social users who are they're actually just re-streaming something that's live, whether it's the Oscars, whatever it may be. But what they're doing is they're overlaying their their commentary. They're thought they're almost presenting the Oscars to their audience. And I think mm -hmm. it's Facebook's attempt at doing that. If, if if Facebook can have the rights to an event like the Oscars, then what would be better than watching the Oscars with Cami Sutra? I mean, really. Yeah. But um I, I think that's that's Facebook that's why we're seeing this move. It's it, and I think uh, uh, part of what you're saying there, Nicole brings it up, uh, uh, Facebook essentially trying to recreate the whole family getting together and watching a show as a unit, except this is now with your digital family. And I think that's right. I think and so if they get content such as the Oscars or something to that, uh, that effect, I think you will get more people watching and commenting together. Uh, when, when Facebook Live uh, initially launched and we started seeing – you know, when there was a when there's big news stories and and news was going live on Facebook Live, you'd see a lot of interaction. Uh, you know, whether it be uh, there were a couple of terrorist attacks, I think in 2016, when Facebook Live was basically brand new and and people really jumped on that together and were interacting and commenting and 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 concerned about what was going on. So in big events like that, so now they're going to try and bring it over to to more of a entertainment style. And uh, I think they need uh, better content in order to do that. Uh, and, and Nick, they're going to have to do that if you think about it, you know, because they're competing not just against, uh, you know, other social media channels, but they're also competing against their users, you know, mm -hmm. because, I mean, in a way, you know, they're not intending to compete with their users, but they have to mm -hmm. um, because hey, their users might have better content. They're just providing the, the media and the platform. But I think they also have to compete with the likes of Netflix, They've got to compete with the le so you know Netflix you know they've tested some viewing party stuff before. Um, Netflix is getting you know most of the movie studios are moving their content or sorry not the movie studios the actors are signing contracts with Netflix now to produce shows there. I mean you have major actors you know moving over there. Will Smith had something recently. Just recently, um, you know you've got Netflix, you've got YouTube doing their watch party. Every it's again trying to get eyeballs on content and advertising dollars. So I think there's a bigger play here that, you know, and, you know, and Facebook's also been moving into like sports as well, trying to get live sports going on. So, right. you know, as Kerry mentioned, they do a lot of everything. And I think now they're starting to try to harness a lot of those things into one particular uh, feature. So we'll see what happens with this. Yeah, we will. We will. Our next story comes out of LinkedIn. This is uh, an email that Christian got as a as a group admin. And that, came, that this came uh, today, it looks like, Christian. Uh, did, uh, yeah, yesterday, yeah, or today, yesterday, yesterday. Or today yeah. Uh, 
And they say they're currently working on making some changes to LinkedIn Group's experience. Uh, and you're, you're a valued admin, Christian, as they, as they indicate here. Groups is at the heart of what makes LinkedIn a trusted place for professionals to help and support one another. And the changes we're planning will make groups a bigger part of the main LinkedIn experience. Our focus on reintegrating groups back into the core LinkedIn experience means it will no longer be able to support a standalone iOS app for groups which I got to tell you, I didn't know that existed. Uh, and I run a group, uh, but I almost always do it from desktop. Please know that your existing group memberships and contributions will not be affected as part of that change. As a preview, here are some of the improvements you can look forward to. Discover and ask, access groups more easily. You'll be able to access your groups right from the home page, and you'll see the latest content from your groups in notifications and the home page feed. Be a part of richer conversations. You'll be able to post m videos into your groups, uh, at mention the members you want to weigh in, and keep the conversation going by replying to comments. Ultimately, their goal is to create an even better groups experience within the primary LinkedIn applications, so they're putting their focus over there in the coming weeks and months. Uh, I think this has been a long time coming for LinkedIn. Uh, a friend of ours uh, uh, in the... Uh, in the Legal Minds group, Nancy Maryland just wrote a blog post on this. It, it is, it, it, the groups have basically been, it, many groups, I should say, have been sort of a, uh, a dead zone for a really long time. So, and people don't really, inter I certainly find a lot of, not very much interaction on LinkedIn in the groups. So I think these changes hopefully will improve some of that. Uh, many of us have gone to Facebook groups that we participate in, even professionally, because those groups were much more active. Cami, what are your thoughts on the changes to LinkedIn? Um, like you say, very much uh, long overdue. Um, I, I, I too didn't know it was a, a standalone app. I, I was completely unaware of that, but it seems that it's a LinkedIn reaction that, that basically they've noticed the, the usage of Facebook groups, like again, you've mentioned. They, uh, they're clearly just kind of trying to follow on from that. But, um, again, it's my cynicism coming through, but I look at, um, I look at the private messaging option on LinkedIn. And uh, myself and your myself and your guest actually from last week, Joanne, she uh -huh. um she she and I when we first started connecting on LinkedIn and we go into the, the direct messaging and it gives you prompts just just in case you don't know what to say to someone. It's got prompts for you for Hi Joanne, I, I see you're connected to Helen Blinden. Right. Like, as long as the groups actually remain authentic real don't give people just these options to hit buttons and because i think that will undermine what they're trying to achieve through the introduction of groups but it's uh it's one of the two i mean especially in a business context where conversations can be very very private they can they can be behind firewall after firewall it, it, it's so important that, uh, that they don't lose the authenticity side of that because nobody's going to get any business if it's a generic one button yes. message that you're sending to people. Yes, some of, the, some of the messaging is is really poor and when you get it uh, or, or when somebody, when you, you make a, a change in your employment and somebody say, sends the congratulations, the, you know, lame pre, pre-made congratulations, it's pretty, pretty bad. Uh, so hopefully the groups will require actual interaction. I mean, I, I'd make him. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Cammy. No, I mean, right from the off, I, I used LinkedIn like anyone else as a, an online CV holder. But um, I, as I say, I work with a branding agency and we've got a lot of graphic designers. So, and I have got more endorsements for logo design than a lot of the graphic designers that I work with who are amazing at logo design. I've not got a clue how to do logo design, but I've got more endorsements than them. It's <laughs> nice one. I still no, tease them about it. But um, yeah, I, I can't get my head around it at all. 
Yeah. Christian, what are your thoughts on this? You, you, so, being, <laughs> you actually having knowledge that this iOS app existed for LinkedIn groups. I, I'm, I'm interested to see your thoughts on this. So I think overall, I, I think this is, you know, as, as Cam mentioned here, like this has been a long time coming for LinkedIn groups. Um, one of the frustrating things about using LinkedIn was that, you know, certain things would work on mobile, certain things would not. Uh, groups being one of them and then being tasked with trying to manage different groups on LinkedIn. And I think uh, I, I'm glad that they're actually finally, finally, finally overhauling these. Um, I think they're I, here's the thing. I think they're actually pull, pulling a page out of Facebook's book. Uh, Facebook got rid of their groups app uh, a few months back and they focused on, you know, improving the desktop experience um, and, and the mobile experience. In this case, LinkedIn is doing the same thing. And I think it's LinkedIn finally realizing we need to do something about this. Um, we need to build community and they need to help people build community because LinkedIn has been doing a lot of really positive things over the past few months. You know, they're starting to cut the clutter. They're starting to finally revamp their really old and tired interface that they've had. Um, yep. You know, yes, it looks just like Facebook, but people are coming back there saying, hey, you know what? There's real world application here as a business, um, you know, because Chance, you know, hopefully at least the people there, you know, that I'm adding into groups and whatnot are connecting with are actually people, um, you know, I, kind of as Cameron mentioned here just a second ago, there are people that actually, you know, like know what my skills are versus, you know, giving me, you know, a, 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 um, in, uh, giving me an endorsement for graphic design that doesn't really kind of jive with what my background is or, um, you know, saying, hey, congrats on the work anniversary, as you mentioned. I mean, that's a pre-populated canned response. Um, that you can just tap a button and hey, it says congrats. Um, so I'm re I'm really glad that LinkedIn is making these updates. I think from a business perspective, um, you know, Danica mentioned this as well. She hasn't used LinkedIn in a while, but it's I think it's time to start revisiting LinkedIn and see what you can actually you know get out of it. Um, I do think that you know, and we kind of talked about this on the beginning of the show. I think that you know there needs to be some sort of vetting though on everything that people are putting up on their profiles. Because LinkedIn, for instance, everybody ha it has this stigma that it's my digital CV, it's my you know, it's my digital Rolodex. But yet, you know, as Cameron mentioned here, there's there are quite a few holes there with the content that people are putting up. You know, they're putting a photo up that says, "Hey, I've been on you know CBS and ABC and NBC and whatnot," and you know, anybody can do that. It takes two seconds. Right. Or they're they're getting their friends to endorse them for skills that maybe they really don't have. But hey, it helps me show up higher in search results. Um, so I think. This is a good move by LinkedIn. I think the next thing they need to focus on is improving the quality of somebody's profile. Maybe have them have like a business email address or something like that that actually verifies, um, you know, that they work for that company or something to that effect. Yeah, yeah, good ideas. Our next story, uh, and this one's interesting, and we've got a couple of legal uh, vloggers uh, in here or legal video makers in here watching tonight. So this is additional changes to the YouTube partner program to better protect to better protect creators, they say. But this is really interesting because this comes out right after the Logan Paul mishap. Uh, and this came out uh, just two days ago. 2017, well, I'm not going to get into some of their some of their uh, issues uh, in the first paragraph. They're usually uh, usually nothing of, of great importance there. So in December, they, uh, they they're making changes. They started making changes to address issues that affected the community in 2017. Is anybody else getting cell phone interference or phone interference? Am I on my own here? Just a little. OK. Uh, they're, they're trying to prevent bad actors from harming uh, the inspiring original creators around the world who make their living on YouTube. Big part of that effort will be strengthening our requirements for monetization so spammers, impersonators, and other bad actors can't hurt their ecosystem or take advantage of you and your content. Uh, Back in April of 2017, we set a YPP eligibility requirement of 10,000 lifetime views. Uh, while that threshold provided more information to determine whether a channel followed our, their community guidelines and policies. It's been clear over the last few months that we needed higher sta a higher standard. So starting on January 16th, uh, they were changing the eligibility requirements for monetization to 4,000 hours of watch time within the past 12 months. 
and a thousand subscribers. We've arrived at these new thresholds uh, after a thorough analysis and conversations with creators. These this new standard will allow us to uh, allow YouTube to significantly improve their ability to identify creators who contribute positively, 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 excuse me, to the community and help drive more ad revenue to them and away from bad actors. So on this will start on February 20th. That's when they'll implement this threshold across existing channels. Cammy, you do more YouTubing than I do. I mean, Cammy and Christian both do. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Do you think this is a good move? Well, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't watch any television, traditional television. I've not even watched it for five years. I would go as far as that. So I, I watch YouTube. That's my television replacement. And um, and as as we mentioned with uh, with the Facebook vetting. Um, I'm very wary of what YouTube are doing here because they're they're coming in. They're going to be vetting it. As, yes, we need to stop hate speech, but we need to make sure we get the the unpopular speech still being available. Social media is about free speech, and, uh, and I think I think we need to all remember that, or else we'll lose it. But um, on the flip side, I, I, I try to find a positive approach to this uh, to what YouTube are up to. And um, as a content creator, as someone that puts content onto YouTube, even if I was in the, the fortunate position to, to monetize the content and put ads on it, I wouldn't. Me personally, I wouldn't. And um, I think what people need to remember is that monetizing YouTube videos is a privilege. It, it's not a, a given right. And I don't think what YouTube are asking is too extreme. I mean, what, 4,000 hours of viewing time and 1,000 subscribers in 12 months? I think if you're not achieving that, then you don't deserve to be paid <laughs> by YouTube, in yeah, all I, honesty. But, yeah, I think um, it's their way of, of, of making sure that quality content or content that people want to consume is is what their their partners are getting paid for. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying. I mean, if, if hate speech is going up and it's getting X amount of views and then it's been pulled down, then the, the, at the moment, content creators are still achieving the, the revenue they want. They're still, and goodness knows where that money's been funneled into. But yes, fantastic. Vet the content. Let's make sure that the nonsense is off of YouTube. Let's keep the free speech. And let's remind all the users that it's it's a privilege to be getting any sort of payment. I mean, as somebody that makes content every day and doesn't get paid a penny for it. <laughs> it's, it I mean, it's one of one of my one of the YouTubers I watch actually is in, he's in gaming. He focuses on gaming. Um, his name is Yong Ye. He's in Korean defense, but anyway, he he goes on to YouTube. He doesn't monetize. He, he's got thousands. Of subscribers, thousands of views. He doesn't monetize his YouTube. He uses the other platforms like Patreon or Twitch to allow his audience to actually, if they if they can afford, if they want to contribute, they can. And I, I think that that's the approach that people should go into video making with. It shouldn't be a okay if I get on YouTube, I put a video up, I'll be rich, I'll quit my job. That will be it. I can go into my LinkedIn group and I'll make a fortune. Right. You know, right. It's, um, I, I think it's I think it's a good step, but at the same time, don't take away with free speech. I agree. I agree. Christian, what are your thoughts on this? You think this is a good move? You've been making videos longer, I think, than most of us in here. So uh, I, I'm gonna, you know, I, I've got quite a few views on this. So I think for starters, I think that. This is going to hurt a lot of small business owners. A lot of people start YouTube channels. You know, they don't go in there thinking like, hey, I'm going to make a lot of money on it. Um, so but they do use some of that revenue. You know, and it might not be a lot here. Um, they do use some of that revenue to, you know, try to improve you know, their YouTube channel or get better at what they're doing. So I do agree that this is a bit of a privilege. But I also think that I think that the requirements are a little high. For example, like my channel, like or my social stuff channel, like I kicked off of this. Um, or it's going to get kicked off because, hey, I don't have a thousand subscribers, but I, you know, I might meet the 4,000 hours of content uh, or a watch time at least. 
So, you know, so in that case, like I can't, you know, you can't make somebody subscribe to your channel, uh, but you also don't want to get into doing, you know, like, let me sub for you, you know, I'll sub you and you sub for me, like, because that essentially is building a fake community essentially there. Right. Um, so, you know, you can't make somebody go subscribe. But I do like the fact, though, that Cameron mentioned here, you know, an alternative like Patreon is a great example. Um, you could go there and, you know, and that could become part of your channel strategy on YouTube to be able to, you know, to monetize it. Um, so I think these requirements are a little high. You do have 30 days to, you know, actually deal with these. But, um, you know, when you look at it, really, I mean, the thousand subscribers, that might not be, you know, the biggest requirement, but 4,000 hours of watch time is a lot. Um, you know, if you really think about it over 12 months, over uh, 12 I think months. it's a. I think it's a Not privilege. Subscribers. <laughs> well, yeah. but they have to be active. Well, if they're active, I mean, you know, so, but you do have to get them to actually watch. And, you know, I think everything is actually becoming more fragmented to the point where somebody can go watch your content on, say, YouTube versus over on, say, Facebook, or maybe you repurpose it, put it up on Snapchat or Instagram, you know, in another way. So I think it's harder. I think it's going to be harder for people to actually be able to monetize. Um, but, you know, I also think at the same time, like, I think I think they're partly doing this, you know, and Joe mentioned this earlier. I think they might be doing this because of the whole Logan Paul issue. You know, if I were YouTube, I would not have allowed Logan Paul on to begin with, honestly. Like, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to say this. I mean, like, it, it's pretty easy to like, I don't like you can look at somebody's content and say, hey, you know what? This is, you know, this is a bad apple, for instance. Like, you, I'm not saying he's a bad apple, but you can look at it and say, hey, you know what? This has happened multiple times or, you know, there's there's questionable content. It's not hard to look through comments, you know, to look through like, you know, to look at a couple of videos here and there and see that there are signs that something else is going on here, you know, beyond just saying, hey, let's have this person in our program because it's good for our business. Mm -hmm. um, I think a business needs to look at it from that perspective, because, you know, as they mentioned, a lot of their people that have channels are going to be affected by this, um, you know, and they might be using that as a lifeline just to, you know, try and generate you know, some revenue for their business. So, um, you know, and, and Joe mentioned, yeah, why does the bad Apple have so many subscribers? Again, I, I don't know how they get their subscribers. Um, I would, I would probably say there's probably a lot of link farms, you know, a lot of, uh, click, uh, a lot of farming systems per se, you know, with this sort of thing. But I think, you know, really they need to maybe start at the top and say, Hey, you know what, let's look at the people that are, 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 you know, distinguished viewers. And if those people like have anything that's questionable, let's just kick those people off of things um, rather than saying, hey, let's change this requirement for everybody. Because um, I think it's a pretty swift move. I don't think 30 days is enough time to be able to, you know, get 4,000 hours of watch time and 1,000 subscribers. All right. Well, let's get to this last story because I know we got a couple of uh, tools still. And this is a big, big story in the last six, seven days. Uh, Facebook wants to bring people closer together. At least that's, uh, that's their, their, uh, their spin on the new update. Uh, today, this came out about six days ago. Today we use signals like how many people react to, comment on, or share posts to determine how high they appear in the newsfeed. With the new update, we'll also pri prioritize posts that spark conversations and meaningful interactions between people. To do this, we will predict which posts you might want to interact with your friends about and show these posts higher in feed. These are posts that inspire back and forth discussion in the comments of posts that you might want to share and react to. We also prioritize posts from family and friends over public content consistent with their news feed values. What does this mean for pages and public content? Because space in news feed is limited, showing more posts from friends and family and updates that spark conversations means we'll show less public content, including videos and other posts from publishers, publishers or businesses. As we make these updates, pages may see their reach, video, watch time, and referral traffic decrease. The impact will vary from page to page, driven by factors including the type of content they produce and how people inter interact with it. Pages making posts that people generally don't react to or comment on could see the biggest decreases in distribution. Pages whose posts prompt conversation between friends will see less of an effect. So uh, I'm not sure in my business that I'm going to notice a, a noticeable decrease in activity on our page because I can't tell you that I've seen tons of activity on our business page to begin with. Cami, what are your thoughts? I must admit, I am, I am 
being uh, being the creative type of person that I try to be, um, I'm delighted with this. I I know it probably goes against the grain of most marketers, but um, the, the I've been against Facebook for so long because instead of focusing on good content and creative content, it's uh, it's been more like let's irritate at scale. You know what I mean? It's very much how can I get creative with my marketing budget or how can I get creative with the demographic I'm targeting? Thankfully now, it, to me, it seems that Facebook are moving. In fact, I've been I've been saying for a long time actually that Facebook has been suffering a bit of a, an identity crisis, a, a brand identity crisis. Um, they, they used to be the platform that would focus on friends and family and the, the content that surrounded you. But, um, but, but Snapchat arrived and kind of took that off them while Facebook were busy entertaining brands and creating ad products and offering everything under the sun. I think they actually lost their way a bit and, and they became the, the Walmart, if you will, the, the, the platform that offered everything. Whereas mm-hmm. when somebody wanted a, a good cut of steak or a, or a good watch, you would go to a butcher shop or a, a watchmaker for, for something specific like that. Whereas you you only go to Facebook or the supermarket for your bread or your eggs or your milk. And, and what I'm going to try to get at here is that what, what Facebook now is trying to do is they're trying to go back to becoming about friends and family and the content surrounding you. So businesses and brands, the creative, the, the, the creative is the variable to, to successful content again. It's not about money. It's not about, oh, if you like it, then I'll like yours. And it is now seriously about creating good content. And you look at the best ads, the best ads out there are the ones that people go onto a platform like YouTube, believe it or not, but YouTube to, to go and watch these ads. You think about Christmas time and that's that's a good creative ad because people are wanting to engage with it. Right. And now Facebook have to uh, brands trying to use Facebook for those those means. They have to get creative about it now. So I'm delighted, like seriously delighted. Might yeah. even start using the platform again. Might use might start using Facebook again. Uh, Christian, what are your thoughts? So I want to say, first off, I mean, Joanne brings up a great question. And that question is, um, let me actually find this real quick. Um, she says, you know, do you think it's too late, um, you know, for businesses, brands and whatnot to revamp their strategy? So uh, first off, I want, I'll answer the question. Then I'll answer Joanne's question here, actually. So I think that um, this will, you know, this will have some, you know, ripple effects. I think that from a business perspective, um, it's about creating good content. I mean, you know, as Cammy mentioned here, like it's all about creating good content. And um, a lot of people, if you've been, you know, you kind of have known this for years, but Facebook reach, Facebook reach has been steadily declining where they want you to pay for ads. And that's, you know, that's, that's going to be the case with anything that you do. It doesn't matter if it's Facebook or anything else. Um, you know, everybody's going to start out with like, you know, maybe they'll try an, an ad free model to get you using it. And then, Hey, they're going to have to introduce ads because they got to pay for things. Um, so I think that that's going to happen. Um, but I think at the same time, um, I think that, you know, if you're doing things the right way, like if you've always been doing things the right way, you know, not just, you know, not using tricky engagement tactics, um, you know, maybe put some ad budget here and there, posting good content, building a community, you're going to not have any issues with this at all. Um, you know, it's all about building a community and, you know, using a Facebook, running a Facebook live video or, uh, you know, doing like, this is a great way for instance to generate discussion because, Hey, we're, we're sitting here talking with everybody and I'm going to actually ask everybody a question right now. You know, what do you guys think about this? Have you seen any impact on your page uh, reach so far in newsfeed, you know, for anybody who's watching here, um, you know, leave that in the comments, but you know, it's all about creating content that's engaging. And, and here's the thing. It, it's almost going back to the YouTube story, you know, about like YouTube kicking off channels that aren't necessarily getting, you know, viewers, uh, meaning subscribers and watch time. It's almost the same exact thing. I mean, if um, Facebook, you know, they're going to lower your reach if your content's not engaging. Pretty simple. Mm-hmm. 
you know, and, and what is that going to say? It's going to go to Joanne's point, which is like, do you think it's too late? I don't think it's too late. I think that there are going to be some challenges for a number of businesses that do not have a strategy in place or have not had a strategy in place. Um, most people just use, you know, the, you know, here's the thing. If I'm a small business and I'm trying to do this myself, solopreneur, um, I'm going to probably be creating, you know, memes and quotes and, you know, uh, pieces of content that, you know, like they serve a little bit of a purpose um, if, when used in the right context, but they're not going to help drive sales, you know, and whatnot. And from a business perspective, you, you need to really focus on what it is that you're doing and what you can do to like really bring the value out in what your business is about. That's where I think that, you know, that businesses are going to struggle with. Um, but you know, it's not too late. It's, ne it's never, here's the thing. It's never too late. I think on anything really. And yeah, yeah I, I agree. I don't think it's too late. I don't think it's too late, but I also, yeah, I, I, I think the way Cami does, uh, you know, this is, it, it's time to build good content, uh, quality content and a good community around what you're doing. Uh, and, and it may make coming back to Facebook, uh, more palatable for many of us. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. Facebook's got a lot of things they're doing. They're, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be pushing people to use Facebook watch because they want you to build community that way, you know, to bring your friends in to get them, you know, yes, it's going to get people to stay on Facebook longer, but it's going to also get you to get people to view your content and engage with it. Um, you know, so they're going to, I think Facebook watch is going to be big. They're going to move. I think they're going to move to TV shows or essentially the, sh the, the show model per se. Um, of having right. people have a page specifically for their show where they can subscribe and get notified and that sort of stuff. That will minimize the number of updates. But, Kami, go ahead. You were saying something? So, sorry, just to very quickly touch on uh, Joanne's oh, yeah. question there about is it too late? I'm, I, I'm the, I don't think so. I think now is the time, actually. I think now is the time that small business owners have been waiting on because if, if Johnny's Bistro I mean, Johnny's Bistro, who don't have much engagement on their Facebook page, they, they don't see the point because they can't afford to, to cough up the ad budget to get the, the recognition that they, they feel they deserve. But Johnny's Bistro need to learn that, that everything they do, you just need to watch Snapchat and you will see people making cups of coffee every single day. They will make cups of coffee and they will video it and they will shoot it. Now, Johnny's Bistro need to learn that, that them making a coffee is the content. The, all content is is access and effort. Access to your skill, your intellect, your humour, and then the, the actual effort into producing the content. And it's the effort part that brands suffer with. They don't like to do they put in the effort. And that's where we'll see the winners, the ones that put in the effort. Because they've got the access is there. It's just the effort that they require, and that's what's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Christian, I, uh, I hate to cut this short on this topic, but we've got to get to some to uh, we got to get some tools before we run out of time here. Definitely. And, and by the way, Kami, that that's a great point. I mean, the you know the platform. I mean, and that's the whole premise of Facebook all along. In this case, or any social media channel, it's there. They give you the tools. You know, yeah, they have advertising and whatnot. But they do it in a meet, they do it in a way to give you to enable you to be a content creator. And you know, and you only become a content creator by taking that first step by by doing something, by trying something, saying, Hey, you know what? Is this working? No, it's not. Like, don't just go through the repetitive motions. You know, stop and think what you're doing. So um, so with that, I'm, I want to thank everybody for joining tonight. So I'm gonna run through some tools real quick. So I've got two tools for everybody tonight. Um, the first tool is called Cinti One. Uh, Cincy One is a very, very, very interesting tool. I'm going to actually share my desktop here real quick with everybody. Um, so Cincy One is a social listening and reputation management platform. Now it's a paid tool, but you know you're going to get that when you get quality uh, when you get quality um, tools here. In this case, you know they make it easy for you to you know not have to go check your social media channels. Um, what they do with Cincy One is you can basically uh, pull everything into a dashboard and check everything. So we're gonna try to pull this up real quick. Let me see. Okay, uh, Cam, I'm gonna, or you know what? Um, nah, you know I'm not gonna bring it up. Okay, so I put the link in the comments for everybody. But Senti One is a social listening uh, platform. Um, very useful tool. It's a paid tool, but what you can also do is not just monitor your brand, but you can also put in specific keywords. So for example, they give this example on their site. If I'm looking for the word online listening, or in this case, you could put in you know insert 
keyword of choice for your business, um, maybe you're in like you know, the automotive industry, for instance, um, you can use Senti One to identify conversations, which would then be opportunities for you to reach out to somebody and help them or offer your services or let them know about your services. Um, so it's a way to manage your reputation, uh, you know, your business, um, but also, you know, talk with your customers and also then um, identify new prospecting opportunities. So that's Senti One. And, and I will say it's a bit of a, you know, a pricey tool. Um, it's, let me get the price for everybody actually. The price is actually 49 euros per month. I think it's about $60. It goes up to a team plan, but uh, basically it lets you access, you know, all the people that are talking about your brand. So okay. very, very, very worthwhile tool. Yeah. Cool. All right. Have you used it? Uh, I have not signed up for this one yet, but I, I like to identify tools that I think are like crucial for a business, you know, like having, for instance, you know, something to monitor your reputation. This will save you a ton of time instead of having to like go to Facebook and try to find all the people that are, you know, Try using Facebook search, um, go to Twitter search, you know, go to Instagram, go to, you know, Snapchat. Like you're not just looking for like who's talking about my brand, but you're also looking for people that, you know, are talking about your brand. But, hey, they're not mentioning you necessarily. Um, right. But you're also looking for people that are using certain keywords that, you know, give you inroads opportunities as a business. So have you used this one before, Cameron? Do you know, I, I haven't. I haven't used this one. I've, I have experience of using other social listening tools and. For, for me, the the usefulness of any tool is kind of reliant on the, the skill of the <laughs> the operator. But um, yes. but I, al I often feel that, that especially listening tools can sometimes be used as a a, a barrier or a hurdle for people to. Oh, do you know what? I won't go and engage with those posts just now because I I need to do my listening first. And I think, especially in the context of what what we've been discussing tonight. Um, mm -hmm. listening is only part of a conversation I yeah. think for me, it's conversation that we're trying to create and yeah okay listening is a big part of that but is it the most important part six and half a dozen I mean really who knows um, as I say tools for me are they're always I'm always a bit wary of tools sometimes they just clutter what you're actually trying to achieve yeah, yeah. I, I feel the same. It, it, I think it really depends on the tool. What's our second, Christian? The second tool is actually called Linkle. And and Linkle, Linkly, I'm not sure exactly if I'm saying that right, but this tool is, uh, it's a tool that I actually have uh, I've included also in another article that I wrote. And um, But this tool is a tool, and this is actually a very useful tool. So one of the challenges with social media profiles is they only let you add one link usually to your profile. So what Linkle, Linkle Linkly, however it pronounces it, however you pronounce it, what they basically let you do is they essentially let you make a link through their site and you can add all of your important topics. That could be, you know, maybe it's like three of your latest blog posts and the main social media channels you want somebody to go and uh, find you on or connect with you on. So what Linkle, what they do is you basically create a link through their site and then that gives you one link and then you go back to your website or your social media channel, you can put the link in your profile. And when somebody clicks on it, instead of going directly to like say one particular, you know, just your website, they go to a whole page that has all these different links on them. So uh, very, very, very useful tool. It's actually, I haven't seen a paid option for it, it's free. Um, you know, and it's a fantastic uh, idea for people to be able to uh, maximize their uh, limited uh, space in the social media profiles. Like for example, on Instagram, you can have one link. You can't have any link on your content instead of having to go change that. You know, this is a really good tool. Um, and I'm actually going to drop another, uh, URL in there to, to some additional tools that do very similar work as well. Um, these are ones that you could use for Instagram mainly, but they work for all very the social cool. media channels. Yeah. Very cool. That wraps us up for tonight. I want to thank Cameron Murray, Cammy Murray, for being with us tonight, Cammy. I really appreciate you checking in, especially at such an early hour for you. Where can people get in touch with you if they uh, tell everybody where to find you on social media or online? I I'm across social media, uh, Cammy Sutra Six, obviously, but um, but yeah. Snapchat, Snapchat is where you'll get to know me properly, and and Twitter. If you, if you're not quite the Snapchat type, you'll you'll find me on Twitter. Excellent, excellent, 
at Cami Sutra Six, Snapchat, Twitter, and, and really across all social media. Christian, any last? Uh, we, there's a few items we didn't get to that'll be on the blog post. Is that right? Yeah, we'll have we got a couple of items. They're smaller items. We'll have those up on the blog post recap that'll go out tomorrow, Friday. Um, and then the other thing I just want to mention. Well, first off, I want to say, Cameron, thanks so much for joining us today. You know, it was really a pleasure yeah. to have you on the show. Um, you shared a lot of really valuable insight. You know that I think that you know our viewers can really uh, you know take the heart and you know, hopefully make some adjustments in their business and get it moving in the right direction. Um, I, and then I just want to say, apologize. I apologize for the need for subtitles this week. I, uh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's all good. right we'll, we'll, we'll get a we'll have to do the closed captioning on this one cammy <laughs> yes um and, and next week uh next week nick we're going to be joined by uh sonia figueroa real estate agent social awesome. media addict um uh, but we're going to be live next week on social chatter 10 m eastern standard time so i want to thank everybody for joining and tuning in tonight and just engaging with us and asking so many great questions joanne loved all the feedback you were giving us so um, thanks a lot for joining everyone. And we will see you all next Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Social Night Chatter. All. Night. Have a good day. Night all. See you soon. Bye-bye.